we'll try again. Good morning. Well, welcome to Emmanuel. Welcome to those of you worshiping with us online. I'm Mindy Gokenauer, the pastor here, where we are seeking to build and grow relationships with the community in order to meet needs, proclaim the gospel, and develop faith. As we begin our time of worship this morning, I want to introduce you to Nick. This is Nick McMichael. Um, as we search Hi. for a... Oh, you're getting applause already. As we search for a new organist here at the church, Nick will be leading us um, in the interim time um, on guitar with him. So um, please bear with us as we make this transition um, and we continue to search for an organist. If you know someone um, who is a pianist or an organist and would be interested in um, our organist position, please let me know and I'd love to get them a copy of the job description. Um, please be in prayer for our SPRC as we search um, in this season for a new organist. Tonight is our youth group open house. Uh, if you would like to come and see what our youth do, what they've been up to, what they will be doing this summer, uh, you don't have to have a youth um, or even know a youth to come. Um, our youth group wants you to see what they're doing and what they're all about. So I invite you to come. Uh, we, they meet downstairs um, in the basement here. They call it the basement. Um, and so if you need help, Finding that, go around the outside of the building, don't park up here, um, and come in downstairs. And there will be um, adults and youth there to greet you. That will be at 6 o'clock this evening. I will be offering a new members class on May the 19th following our second service at 1130. If you are not a member of this church and you would like to be, um, I encourage you to sign up for that class. All of our signing sign up sheets live right out here in the hallway up on the bulletin board uh, and so I encourage you to consider uh, being a part um, a full part of what we do here at Emmanuel uh, our new members will join on June 2nd which is our combined service at 9 30. we are having a summer yard sale which is a bring your own stuff and take it home you're listening great job guys um, this is a bring your own stuff, take your own stuff home yard sale. Um, you can sign up for a spot out here uh, where our sign up sheets live. Um, indoor spots are $20, outside spots are 12. Um, and Patty Beasley is here if you have any questions, she can uh, help answer those questions for you. We will be having our regular indoor yard sale um, in the fall, which is where you can bring your stuff and leave it and never have to see it again. Um, that is still happening and the collection for that will start in September. September, probably in September. So stay tuned for that. Um, but this time, bring it and take it with you when you leave. We are still in need of some Vacation Bible School volunteers. If you haven't signed up for that yet, I encourage you to do that. I just wanted to uh, make a quick note that we have not switched online giving platforms. And we've had some questions about that in the last couple of weeks. We are still using Vanco, and you can still get to that through our church website. If you have any questions, please let us know. Our general conference has concluded. We have been praying for general conference um, over the last couple of weeks, and that is um, the big governing body of the United Methodist Church where our rules um, are only able to be changed there in that uh, body of people every four years. Um, we had delegates from our conference here representing us uh, in Charlotte these past two weeks. And they will be offering a webinar um, on Thursday, May 16th from 7 to 8 p.m. and Tuesday, May 21st from 12 to 1 p.m. If anyone is interested in hearing um, kind of firsthand what happened and what decisions were made at General Conference, I encourage you um, to attend those and I can provide that link to sign up if you would like it. One of the major decisions that was made at this year's General Conference was to remove uh, the restrictive language from the Book of Discipline. Our bishops described the change this way. The general conference delegates from all over the world voted to remove language that prohibited United Methodist clergy from performing weddings for same gender couples. This change allows churches and clergy to operate according to their conscience without consequence. There are some important things about this decision that we want you to know. This is from our bishops. First, pastors have always decided who they will marry. This is based on several factors, including the couple's preparation for the marriage covenant. This has not changed. Pastors will continue to decide who they will marry. 
No one will force a pastor to officiate a marriage ceremony for any couple. Second, churches will continue to determine what weddings are held in their church buildings. This is the decision of the local church's board of trustees. Further, the desires of all clergy and congregations in this matter are to be honored and not judged by others. I will share the full letter um, that our bishops put out about general conference, um, and I can put a copy out um, so that you can see it here in the building if you're interested in reading more about that. And if you have questions, I'm happy to answer those. Um, I think what is the most important thing for us to remember is that you, church, are a welcoming body of people that has always and I know will continue to love all and welcome all. This doesn't change a lot for us here, but I wanted to share that information with you so that you are aware of what is happening at the general church level. Would you pray with me? Holy God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks, God, for your goodness, for who you are, and that you never change. And so, God, as we come together to worship, we call upon your name because we trust in its power. We trust, God, that you are here among us. And so may our worship here and now be pleasing and honorable to you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. As you are comfortably able, would you please stand and join us in the call to worship? Sing a new song to the Lord. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Each day proclaim the good news that he saves. Publish his glorious deeds among the nations. Tell everyone about the amazing things he does. For great is the Lord. He is worthy of our praise. You may be seated. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm just thinking. If you all want to join me, uh, I Need the Every Hours, our opening hymn. It's number 397 in your hymnal. I need the every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can.
Loving God, whose touch can heal the broken places of life, touch us today. God of peace, whose spirit of peace can quiet our, li- our spirits of confusion and despair, reassure us today. Forgiving God, whose call to repentance promises grace upon grace, place your mercy in our souls today. You who heal the sick and liberate the imprisoned, who bring the justice in the midst of oppression and strength, in the midst of weakness, pour out your spirit of power upon us today. Open our hearts to fulfill faithfulness, redirect our waywardness, and hold us gently in your goodness. We confess our need to you. We turn to you with hearts filled with hope, remembering the promises you have made to us. May the name be glorified in us through us. We ask it through Christ Jesus, our Lord, our Savior. Amen. Today's scripture is from Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of the religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God forgives sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven or stand up, 
pick up your mat and walk. So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive us, to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. Imagine living a life desperately running after Jesus, willing to do whatever it takes to be in his presence. What would it look like to ever be desperate for Jesus, seeking his presence, forgiveness, and grace? Over the next three weeks, we will be exploring several New Testament stories that exemplify what it means to be desperate for Jesus. Let's pray. Holy God, may your spirit continue to move among us. May we continue to pay attention that we would hear your word, listen to your voice, and respond to you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. I want you to think for a moment how you would define the word desperate. According to Marion Webster, desperate means involving or employing extreme measures in an attempt to escape defeat or frustration. Years ago, my sister and I were driving to our aunt's house in Chicoteague, Virginia. Our family had made this trip a hundred times before, but I had never been the driver. It was just me and my sister, and my sister doesn't drive, so all the driving was on me. And we were about just under half a tank of gas, which is out of the norm for me. I like to drive with a full tank everywhere, just in case. Wait till you hear the rest of the story. Um, So we were getting ready to cross the Bay Bridge. I thought I had remembered that there was a gas station after the bridge, after you get through all of the craziness that is the traffic of the Bay Bridge. Well, I remembered wrong. There was no gas station for miles and miles and miles after the bridge. In fact, I was nearly out of gas when I realized we weren't going to pass a gas station anytime soon. Now, this was before our cell phones could tell us that the gas station was right up the street on the left. Don't fear, it's coming, right? Our phones are pretty smart now. This was in the time where you had the handy dandy in-car GPS um, that you had to upload occasionally to get its maps um, to be correct. I hadn't done that part. um, So my GPS wasn't working exactly the way that it should. And I tend to be pretty picky when it comes to gas stations. I know you've probably heard me share about that many times, Um, but this was a desperate situation. I would take any gas station at this point. The GPS said that there was a gas station a few miles away, but I had to wander back off the route into this tiny little town to find it. Fine, I was desperate. I was going to find this gas station, I'll go anywhere. So I followed my GPS back this two lane road to a tiny little convenience store that did not have a gas pump. So I hop out of the car and I run inside and I beg the cashier, please tell me where I can get some gas. I'm not going to make it much further. He gave me some directions. I went right up the road and made it to the gas station with a few drops of gas to spare. We will do anything when we are desperate. We'll drive on back roads following a GPS that hadn't been updated for months, begging a cashier for help, whatever it takes to get what we need. That's what comes to my mind when I think about desperation. Being desperate makes you do whatever it takes to get what you need, accomplish a task, etc. This same level of desperation also brings people to Jesus. We enter the story in Mark 2 this morning into a kind of a crazy scenario. A paralyzed man is being carried on a mat by four of his friends. They must have heard about the power of Jesus and they knew their friend could be healed if they could just get him to Jesus. 
when the men arrived at the house that Jesus was staying at with their friend, there was no room. There was no way to get into the house. Even the front door was covered with people. So they weren't going to get their friend to Jesus in a conventional way. Did this stop them? Nope. They didn't just quit trying because they couldn't get in. They found another way. These friends dug a hole in the roof of the house that Jesus was staying in. Think mud and clay, not plaster or tile. And they lowered their friend down through the roof to get him in front of Jesus. These friends were so desperate to get their friend to Jesus that they literally tore off the roof of a house to get him there. They tore off the roof. That is some serious desperation. What if we started believing Jesus still had that kind of power? What if we started living in such a way that we sought Jesus with all that we had and we deeply desired that our friends encounter him too? It was the faith of the paralyzed man's friends that brought him to Jesus. Which makes me wonder, what kind of friends are you surrounding yourself with? And what kind of friend are you? We so often lament that our world isn't following Jesus. But how desperate are we to help others encounter him? We can't just join the lament. We need to be a part of the solution. And I believe the solution is turning back to Jesus and desperately pursuing his presence in our lives. And at the same time that I hear this lament from adults, our children and our youth are leading us. Our children and youth are a beautiful example of bringing others to Jesus. Right here in this very church, our children and youth are encountering Jesus. They're learning about his love, goodness, and forgiveness, and having a good time doing it. And in the process, they are bringing others with them. They're inviting their friends because they don't want their friends to miss out on what is happening here. Instead of being afraid that we will be judged because of our faith, let's take on the attitude of our children instead. Let's be so passionate about our love for Jesus that we can't help but tell others about it. I know it's much easier to say than it is to live. I know it's a hard world out there. I know it's not the popular thing to do to go to church, to be kind, to stand up for others, to feed the hungry, fight for injustice, pray for the sick, share our hope in Jesus. But even though it's not popular, do we believe that Jesus still changes lives? Are we still committed to being like Jesus? Because if so, we need to start or return to living like Jesus in the world. Maybe we've lost some of our desperation for Jesus. And maybe it's because we don't see the healings like the one we heard in Mark today. But church, Jesus is still healing. I've seen answered prayer. I know that you have too. I've seen people running full force to Jesus because they know he forgives, comforts, and heals. I've seen addicts turn their lives over to Jesus, fully surrendering to him. I've seen people who have been hurt by the church return to God's word. I've seen children ask their parents to go to church because they want to know about Jesus. I've seen all these things and so many more. Jesus still has power, church. Jesus is still moving. We aren't seeing the power of Jesus because we aren't paying attention. We aren't pursuing Jesus each and every day. It's not a surprise we aren't seeing the power of Jesus at work in our lives. I've recently been listening to a variety of people share why they don't attend church. And it has very little to do with Jesus and almost everything to do with people who claim to follow Jesus but aren't living like it. 
the organized church has stopped desperately pursuing Jesus. We have turned inward, more concerned about preserving what used to be than we are about sharing the hope, love, and saving power of Jesus with others. We aren't the first to struggle in this area. The Pharisees struggled too. Jesus forgives the sin of the paralyzed man because of the faith of his four friends. And the Pharisees have a fit. That's my interpretation. Who does Jesus think he is forgiving sins like that? Only God can forgive sins. This is outrageous. Now, the Pharisees never liked what Jesus was doing. Jesus didn't do things the way they used to be done. Jesus didn't stick to the status quo. And the Pharisees thought that they were so much more righteous than everyone else that they couldn't see the beauty and value in what Jesus was doing among them. They could only complain and accuse Jesus of blasphemy and breaking the law. We are probably more like the Pharisees than we are comfortable admitting. And when we see something that is outside of what we're used to, we complain and protest that that thing, whatever it is, couldn't possibly be of God because it doesn't look like we used to do. The majority of us are not desperate to be in the presence of Jesus. We come on Sunday morning not expecting a life-changing encounter but to check a mark off a box. We come complaining, come criticizing, come out of duty. Some come for community, looking for answers, looking to belong. But how many of us truly come desperate to find Jesus? Do we really believe that Jesus changes lives? That he can still change ours? My friend Michelle recently said, Our faith has shifted from desperation, our only hope, to our last line of defense. It's time to rediscover our passion for Jesus. It's time to start paying attention and start looking for the power of Jesus because it is here among us. It's time for Jesus to be our first hope and not our last resort. Spend some time in prayer this week. Ask God to move in a powerful way in your life and then pay attention to the ways that God shows up. Be open to Jesus this week. Be open to something new, to someone new. Maybe God is trying to speak to you, but you've been ignoring it because it doesn't look like you're used to. Surround yourself with people who are desperately seeking Jesus. Become that person yourself. Do whatever it takes to be in God's presence. The name of Jesus still has power. God is still moving here among us. Let's start doing whatever it takes to be in his presence, that our lives and the lives of those around us would be changed because of the power of Jesus. Let's pray. Holy God, we know your name still has power. And we know, God, because we come before you and we call upon it, trusting and believing that you are at work. That you're at work in us, that you're at work in one another, and that you're at work in the world. Help us to learn to trust you. Help us to learn to sit and be in your presence, that we would be desperate for it. May we be unashamed to call ourselves your faithful people. And may we be so desperate to be with you that we would bring others with us too. And God, because we believe in the power of your name, that you are still at work and that you are still healing, we bring before you our greatest concerns. And we celebrate our greatest joys because we know that you are present. God, we continue to lift Susie Herzog to you. God, we rejoice 
and the healing that has already taken place in Susie. We give you all of the praise. We ask God that you would continue to provide her healing that she would be able to speak again. God, we lift up Tris Rhodes and her family as they continue to grieve the loss of Tris's mother. We ask God that they would feel your peace and presence in this time. We lift, continue to lift up Barb Divini and her family as they grieve the loss of Barb's brother. God, we trust that in our grief you are with us, that you are present and you know our pain. And we lift up Sue Walker, who is home from the hospital, and we ask God that you would continue to provide her healing. We lift up Danny and Alyssa Brown, who have both been diagnosed with cancer, and we ask God that your healing touch would be upon both of them in this difficult time. And for all of those suffering here in this place, may we feel your presence upon us. May we know that we are not alone. God, we lift up the church to you. We give you thanks for all of the delegates from our general conference that have gathered from all over the world over these last two weeks. And God, we seek you as we move forward as the church. May we never lose sight of who you are and who you've called and created us to be. And so God, as your people, as one body, we join our voices together to pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so church, we are called not to just hear, but to act upon what we've heard. So I invite you to consider how do you need to become more desperate to be in the presence of Jesus? What do you need to do this week? I also invite you to consider how God might be leading you to give this day to give of your tithes and offerings, your gifts and resources, that in all that you have, in all that who you are, may honor God. I invite you to give of your tithes and offerings this morning online, or as you leave, you'll find an offering plate in the back. And as we consider how we might respond to God this morning, I invite you to stand as you are able to join in singing the doxology. God, God, we thank you once again for who you are and for all of the ways that you care for us. And so God, as a sacrifice, as an act of faith, we offer to you a piece, a small piece of what we have. May you pour out your blessing upon our tithes and our gifts and our offerings. May they be honoring and acceptable in your sight. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Friends, would you join me in our closing hymn? It's number 368 in your hymnal if you like to follow along. It's My Hope is Built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, oh, the ground is sinking sand, all oh, other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest 
Christ on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil on Christ the solid rock I stand o'er the ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand his oath his covenant his blood support me sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand. go this day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, reclaiming our desperation to be in the presence of Jesus. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you.